Thanks for tuning in to the Drive On Podcast, where we talk about issues affecting veterans after they get out of the military. Before we get started, I'd like to ask a favor. If you haven't done so already, please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. If you've already done that, thank you. These ratings help the show get discovered so it can reach a wider audience. And while you're there, click the subscribe button so that you get notified of new episodes as soon as they come out. If you don't use Apple Podcasts, you can visit driveonpodcast.com forward slash subscribe to find other ways of subscribing, including our email list. I'm your host, Scott Deluzio, and now let's get on with the show. Hey, everyone. Today, my guest is Julian Torres. Julian is a Marine Corps veteran and host of the Coffee with Julian podcast. Uh, Julian was wounded while serving overseas, and today we're going to be talking to him about his journey uh, through the Marine Corps and, and what life is like after being wounded. Uh, so, Julian, welcome to the show. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, and what your background is? Uh, what's going on, man? How you doing? All right. Good. <laughs> I, uh, um, so, me being a Marine, uh, I enlisted in 2007 and um, uh, was Marine Corps infantry, man. You know, I was a 0331 machine gunner um, by trade. Um, Got deployed in 2010 to march to Afghanistan, and uh, subsequently, you know, I stepped on an IED. You lost both my legs. You know, left leg is below the knee, right leg is above. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, which which was really crazy and really unique. I think about my circumstance. Um, I was only in country in full blown combat operations for like two and a half weeks. I was there for like. I want to say just shy of a month total in Afghanistan and then got hurt, man. Right. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes these things, I mean, they come out of nowhere, you know, and, and, you know, whether you're there for, uh, you know, a few weeks, you're there for a few months or whatever, um, you know, but you, you can't really time these things. Like they, they'll, they'll just happen, you know? Right. Um, like uh, it's either like the very beginning or the, ends like what you don't want right you're like yeah yeah you know sometimes you, you you hear about these these people they have you know a week left or something and they're like oh yeah we'll go out on this one last mission or whatever and you know, last mission it's like no, no it's like no no you don't want to go on that that last mission yeah. um so let's talk about the the lead up to that uh you know so you're in country for uh, you, you said about a month or so before before getting uh injured um what, what did that look like? What did your time in, in Af Afghanistan look like uh, before, before getting injured? Yeah, man. Um, we ended up, it was, I don't know, man. It was, it was what I would call it like, it was like almost as if like all the wars of America were down inside Marja Afghanistan at the time. You know, we had um, really thick, overgrown, canals or wadis you know that were i mean you couldn't see six inches in front of you you know so i i, I would imagine you know from the things i've read that was a lot like vietnam mm -hmm. you know, um cutting yourself on the grass and stuff like that um that was growing through there um and then we also had you know those canals i mean we were fighting in those canals and i was even thinking like that was a little bit like world war one you know fighting in the trenches you yep. know being muddy and being full of water and just disgustingness, you know. Um, and obviously, I mean, it was like, I was, what surprised me the most about it all was how, like, how kinetic it was. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't imagine it being so full throttle like it really was. You know what I mean? I mean, I mean, these people, I mean, we were whipping it on, man. I mean, mm -hmm. be able to hear them, be able to smell them. You know, that's how close we were, you know. Um, and it just was intense. I mean, at the end of the day, I think if I had to pick a word, it was just intense. Intense. Um, you know, like, their their fighting ability, I mean, I wasn't really impressed by. Um, they had a lot of numbers, which was impressive. But other than that, I mean, our tactics were, like, superior. Our fire sure. our superior you know um but yeah i mean it was just intense man yeah for sure um you know i i know 
I know kind of what you're talking about, you know, walking through in an area where you can't really see more than a few inches in front of you. I mean, we, we've, I, I've been on missions in, in Afghanistan where we walked through a cornfield and it was, you know, you, you see cornfields like around, around here in the United States, same deal. Um, it, you know, corn taller than, than you are and you're walking through and you, you can't see too far ahead of you because there's corn all over the place and the, the leaves and everything. Yeah, you just see them like you just see like the stalks like move. Yeah, and you're like, there they are. And and you don't know you don't know what what's on the other side of that because uh, you you just can't see. Um, and and you're walking through just hoping that there's no trip wires or pressure plates or you know other crazy stuff like that 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 they could have put in there um, just to to screw us up. You know, if if we were going through there, so um, you know, thank God, uh, you know, in in my case, anyways, there was there wasn't anything like that, or at least if there was, we didn't stumble across it. Um, you know, so so we we got out, uh, you know, relatively unscathed, other than you know, a free, few uh, scrapes from you know walking up against some of these plants and and things like that. But that's that's nothing in comparison to uh, people like yourself who who were severely uh, wounded during during their their uh their time overseas um so let's let's talk about that day the day of the injury um maybe maybe you could uh you know talk a little bit about the mission uh that you were on um and and how how things kind of led up to that to that event uh you know where where you actually got got wounded blasted <laughs> yeah um, uh so i mean one thing too dude like you have to remember is like yeah dude we had this this in like inherent threat of an IED, right? But for the most part, I mean, that's not what we were really looking for. I mean, we were we were getting a lot of intel on, you know, sniper positions, sniper nest, machine gun nest, uh, observation posts, um, IED, you know, caches. Um, so although we were like, you know, another thing too that was really great and crazy was the fact that like we were just finding a bunch of other things besides you know so we were finding like caches of heroin mm -hmm. we were finding caches of like giant stocks of marijuana um weapons you know id making material um and 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 all, along all of that dude there was like there was like firefights you know what i mean like intense yeah fights so it's like we're, we're actually pinned down and you know maneuvering around the enemy or just waiting them out we're just like man eh, you guys aren't moving we're just gonna hunker down right here we're safe right here yeah um, we'll just let this develop you know um and you know fight back obviously but like we're gonna take our time with this you know what i mean and um but so this particular day that we're that day i got hurt um, it was really crazy because I mean, we, I personally found, um, you know, the little, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they would make IEDs out of these yellow, uh, oil jugs, like cooking oil, like canola mm -hmm. oil jugs with the red top. And so I found a bunch of those. And so what I did was I, you know, pulled out my bench made knife and I cut the bottoms out. You know, I, I, you know, made it to where like, and these jugs are they're not usable anymore or you're going to have to, I'm just going to make it more of a headache for you to use these. Right. Um, you know, the Afghan people were very resourceful, you know what I mean? Making things out of nothing. So, um, I'm sure I didn't damage it too much. Um, but I was also finding like big giant bags of like ammonium nitrate, big giant, you know, 50 kilo pound bags or 50 kilos of, uh, like ammonium nitrate, uh, cut that out you know what i mean um and you know we were fighting all day dude you know what i mean just a you know, standard operation fighting all day pushing the enemy back um and then we were like no more than like 50 yards or maybe like a half a football field away from uh our patrol base and uh just stepped on it man you know it it uh that and i remember it particularly the sound I made getting propelled through the air, seeing my shadow on the ground and realizing like, 
oh fuck man this is it like i got hit like it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know and to realize that like if you see yourself on the ground from an aerial point of view yeah i got hit and um I remember like landing the powder in my mouth from all the, you know, the blast. Um, because what had happened was we had crossed over two canals. And so imagine, you know, we got one canal, a little shallow canal we crossed over and we came onto another one. So it was just consecutive, you know, canals uh, running parallel to each other. And so um, crossed one, crossed the other one. And then my buddy who saw the indicator, you know, the point guy, I was holding rear security for my machine gun and um, that I was in charge of because I was a machine gun squad leader. And uh, the point man says, hey, I see an indicator. I'm like, I'm closest to the junction. I'm closest to where we just, you know, and I'm not going to ask. If I'm not willing, as a sergeant of Marines, I'm not willing to ask other people to do hard decision work or hard hard work in general if i'm not willing to do that kind of stuff myself so i just went i was like i got it man i'll go take a look and i was like looking and like i said we weren't really looking for ids that wasn't our main focus we were looking more for i mean we were finding machine guns we were finding sniper positions um and we were burning those down so that's what i was really looking for you know that's what we were we were facing our immediate threat, you know what I mean? It wasn't until, and I mean, to be honest with you, man, the whole census of everything we were doing was clearing out margin. You know what I mean? We were, it was by definition already cleared out, but the combatants weren't really fighting the first wave. They were just studying mm -hmm. homework and um, going back to that particular moment before I got stuck on an IED, I had crossed over so there was um, nine guys in my stick. I was number 10. And then on the 11th time coming back, saying, dude, there's nothing here, is when I, is when I stepped on it, man. And so a um, few people got hurt. Nobody really catastrophically wounded besides myself, thank God. And um, yeah, man, it, that ID, um, and dude, to be honest with you, man, they say on, you know, it was a pressure plate, but I don't really think so. I think it was remote dead because it was like, you know, 11 guy, you know what I mean? That stepped on it. You know what I mean? Like the initiated ambush afterwards, we weren't receiving any contact prior to that. There was nobody around. I mean, we were, like I said, a half a football field away. So um, I think it was remote dead. I was in between two different houses. So easily somebody could have been sitting in the shadows in the house and just pressed the button. Yep. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's no really way for me to prove it. It's just my hunch. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, a few other uh, Marines got, got injured. Um, and when we previously spoke, you, you mentioned that, um, uh, one of the Marines who, who was injured um, uh, in, in that same incident, obviously not as severely as you. Um, and then a short time later, uh, he was killed in action. Um, right. I, would, would you be willing to talk a little bit about him and, and how, you, uh, uh, how, how you knew him and, and who he was and everything like that? Of course, man, of course. Because... Uh, this individual, um, his name's Cody S. Childers, you know, and his mom runs a nonprofit in his name now, um, the Lance Corporal Cody S. Childers Fund. And he was my machine gunner, right? So he was the guy who was actually on the pig um, running and gunning, and I was walking him on target or I was carrying his ammo because <clears throat> um, they – the company had dissolved my my squad into into different so there was three guns versus only having two by textbook definition so there was each of us got a gun and it was only the the um the gunner plus the, the team leader and i was the team leader slash squad leader 
So um, I was holding rear security for him. And um, that's what made me so close to the junction. And uh, from that point on, when the blast happened and it had shoved him, dislocated his shoulder, um, broke his nose, and he had gotten a concussion from it. Um, and then from there, uh, obviously the ambush initiated, people came, um, gave me immediate treatment. And he was actually one of the guys that showed up, one of the first guys that showed up to, to put Humpty Dumpty back together. <laughs> the, he, uh, what's his dislocated shoulder and his concussion and him being concussed, um, carried me from the battlefield to the helicopter, you know, with his dislocated arm. He was like, I got it. Ah! And he muscled through, you know. Dude was a savage, man. You know what I mean? He was one of those guys who, uh, a good old boy from Virginia, you know what I mean? Good old, I mean, grew up in the woods, grew up hunting. Um, saint of an individual, but dude, but man, you wouldn't want to cross him. You know, really high mm -hmm. principles, really high morals. And even though he was my youngest guy on my squad, he he just, the way he carried himself was of a senior enlisted individual. You know what I mean? He was confident, you know, knowledgeable, um, and just a cool guy to be around. You know what I mean? Like, um, and so when he, when we were in the helicopter together, because he was the only one that got medevac with me, um, he was holding my hand, dude, telling me, you know, you're doing all right, man, hang in there. You know, I'm so sorry. Um, like, I'm really sorry that you got hurt, you know. And him being a Lance Corporal, an E3 in the Marine Corps, comforting a sergeant, you know what I mean? And I think that's what that unconditional love is what you feel. Like, rank doesn't matter. You know, everybody's equal, man. Race doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, ethnicity doesn't matter. Like, where you come from doesn't matter. You know right. what I mean? It's all, like, you all bleed red. And that's, like, I don't know. It's just, it's just really unique, man. I think it's a really unique human experience to go to combat and then get hurt and then survive it. Um, and then while I was – so fast forward a couple of weeks. So that was – I got hurt on July 15th. July 18th. I got um, stateside to Bethesda, Maryland. And then um, fast forward a month, um, on August 20th, he had gotten killed. But in between that time, I had gotten to know his mom. He sent his mom down from Virginia, Chesapeake, Virginia, to come see me so that she can get confirmation, so she can tell him that I'm okay. He's like, I need eye on accountability of this Marine who means so much to me. And um, I need to know he's going to be okay. And so here, so here you are, right? In the middle of a war zone, you know, uh, concerned about your own life, but you're not as concerned as the buddy who's, a, who's oceans in between you. And you're like, that's where my, my thoughts are at. This is with him, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just unique, man. And so um, on my last surgery clean out, um, I get a phone call like six o'clock in the morning, right? They're, I mean, I haven't eaten, I'm fasting. I'm prepared, you know, to go into surgery and the phone ring as I'm leaving my room, right? And I go like, I grab the wall, you know, like stop it. You know, cause I had a feeling you know, because it was very rare to get a phone call that early, you know. And if it was one of my buddies calling from a sat phone, I was like, I want to I wanna talk to him. <laughs> you know, you can fucking wait to... <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, it was his mom. She called me, dude, you know, with a crackly voice and was just like, um, Cody's dead. And I was like, man, all right, you know. And I almost had to, like, choke it down you know, put it in a compartment, dude, and shut the door and just be like, uh, I gotta, I gotta get, get my, get my mind ready for this surgery that I'm in, you know? And, um, yeah, dude. So on August 20th, he got killed. Um, and he got shot one time and they like right below the, I don't know how you guys had it, 
but we had a front sappy plate, back sappy plate, and side sappy plates. Yeah, we had the same setup, yeah. And um, so he, he got hit right underneath that side sappy. So just hit kind of like right where your love handles are at. Yeah. You know, well, you're a pretty thin dude. You probably don't have them, but I <laughs> And so um, uh, it just went in, dude, and never left. He just hit around his rib cages, and um, then that's a wrap, man. And um, from that point, I stayed in real close contact with her, and he's buried in Arlington. So he got buried, um, I want to say, September time frame, like right before – I want to say right before Labor Day weekend. And um, I was like, I was, I was done with my surgeries. I had 100% rehab and they were going to send me to San Diego for uh, the follow-up rehab, the prosthetic care, the physical therapy care, the occupational therapy care, um, and eventually transition out of the military. But uh, I had requested, I was like, there's, there's no way, there's no way that I'm going to leave and have that individual, that particular individual from my unit, um, who meant so much to me and had comforted me and it made me feel, you know, nurtured, you know, in a sense. I mean, he sent he sent his mom to go check on you, and you know what I mean. Like he like that that became more than just you know, uh, you know, two guys who served together. That that became. I mean, he brought his mom in. That's part of family, right? You know, he he, he did he did more. He went above and beyond what the the typical uh, you know marine probably would have done. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah, dude. And so um, I was like, dude, there's no way. You know, I I wouldn't be able to sleep at night knowing that I didn't like at least voice my opinion and fight to stay here, right? Um, but dude, willingly enough. I mean, dude, I, I was fighting off an infection. You know what I mean? I had a pick line. And um, do you know what a pick line is? Yeah, unfortunately, I, I'm familiar with it. My wife was uh, hospitalized a, a, almost a year and a half ago or so. And, uh, yeah, she, she was in the hospital for a couple of weeks and, and had, had her pick line in, in her to help her get through what she was going through and everything. And it's nasty. It's not, not the coolest thing to see. No, dude, so, like, uh, I had, like, a pick line in my arm where they, like, disconnected it from the main tubes, and then I had, like, I I, think I cut a sock to kind of keep everything together, then they taped it, and then they, um, uh, I was, like, I don't have any clothes, you know what I mean? I was, like, 90% of the time I was naked, you know what I mean? So I was, like, I need clothes, and um, so, like, some lady bought me some like cargo shorts and a polo shirt and uh i got a ride to arlington cemetery man my wife and my good friend um who's with a different unit was there and they like pushed me through the grass and stuff like that it was pretty it was just so intense man you know what i mean it was just so like like this is this wasn't the, the part of war that people don't talk about you know, I mean, this was a part of war that was, you know, and maybe they never talked about it because it never happened because the survivability rate nowadays is so much more uh, possible than any yeah. other war before. So, you know, maybe this was, wasn't, this was unique to our war, you know, but I mean, it's like, man, dude, like, you know, what a shit sandwich, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how, how else to explain it other than um, an incredible, unique human experience. Yeah, and, and like you were talking about the survivability, uh, you know, from previous wars, um, you know, just a few inches difference uh, could have been the difference between, uh, you know, your buddy getting, uh, you know, shot the way he was or it hitting the sappy plate on the side and just having a real bad sore, uh, sore side for, you know, a few days, you know, or maybe a couple of weeks. I don't know. I never been shot that way. So I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, but like even too, like if it went down a little further, it would just hit his hip. Yep. A mobility issue. Right. Yeah. But no, man is that. And, and for me, dude, like, 
what are the odds of that happening? And what are the odds of like me surviving? I mean, dude, like on my paperwork, it says I took 90 units of blood that one day. So like I would, I would get so wrapped around the axle of being like, you know, well, how much blood does it take for a human being to start off with? First of all, like where was my, you know, and like I was trying to, for my whole rehab, I, I was really trying to figure out like why I shouldn't be here. I mm-hmm. wanted to myself like why I shouldn't be here. And so I would research these ways of, you know, how much pounds per square inch does it take to remove bone and tissue, you know, and fluid. And then I would, you know, I'd be like, well, see, I should have died then, you know, just by that alone. And then I'd be like, well, then I'd get on the internet and be like, well, how much pounds per square inch does it take to, to make you brain dead? And then I'd realize that that pound per square inch is far less than to remove bone and tissue. And yeah. so I'd be like, ha, there's another reason why I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be here, you know? And then I was like, well, how much blood did I lose? Oh, well, how much blood did I have to start off with? So it's like, they couldn't stop the bleeding, man. You know what I mean? So like, um, I mean, it's just like, what are the odds, man? You know, like, according to science and math, you know, I shouldn't be here, but I'm, but I'm here. Exactly, you know, why- yeah. And like, why is that? You know, what am I doing here? Like, what am I doing today to prove to myself why I should be here? You know, instead of proving to myself why I shouldn't, you know, and there was a whole like mental switch um, in 2011, mostly 2012, that uh, I really started to gain some traction on, um, you know, what am I doing with my life and how best to honor uh, those medical professionals, those warrior professionals lives by, you know, or not lives, but their efforts to save my life. You know what I mean? Right. And, and that's, that brings up a good point because uh, you know, there's a lot of people who go through traumatic experiences, whether they've been wounded or they've seen other people get wounded or uh, some other, uh, you know, tr- traumatizing event. Uh, happens to them and they they play that game like you you started to play with yourself where where you're doing the math and you're trying to figure out you know I should have died at this point I should have died at that point I shouldn't be here right now and you start going down this this spiral of uh, what ifs what if this happened what if that happened I shouldn't be here I, I shouldn't you know, I shouldn't be existing right now or that person should be here if this happened or what you know a, a lot of what ifs uh, start happening and, and popping into people's heads. Uh, and life could have gone really badly for you. Um, you. You could have continued digging down that hole and you could have continued, uh, you know, playing that game and that, that mind game, that mind fuck that, that, that keeps, keeps going on. Um, and I, I want to talk about that. What, like, what, what was it that, that was the turning point for you? You said, you know, 2011, 2012, sometime around there. What was that turning point? What did you do to keep your spirits up? Uh, what kept you from feeling defeated? Um, and, and what type of thing could, could you maybe you offer as advice for other people who might be in a similar situation? Well, dude, I mean, you, that's a pretty loaded question, man. <laughs> you know what I mean, um, I'm trying uh, to dig deep on these. <laughs> No, to no doubt, you know, um, you know, keep in mind, man, like where I was at, like personally, you know, I had a newborn son who was, so did my wife, first of all, dude, my short answer to this was my wife, you know what I mean? She's, you know, she's my true north. She's my, you know, guiding light, you know what I mean? She's my lighthouse, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, dude, you know, and a little backstory on that. I mean, we've been, we've been together since high school, you know? And she, she and I both, we just recently, so my son was born in May 2010. I was deployed in June 2010. And then I got hurt in July 2010. So as, as a spouse, she left to go home. Then she gets to knock on the door and goes through the whole gamut, Marines in dress blues. She thinks I'm dead. You know what I mean? This was like six o'clock in the morning, local time. 
you know, she's like, hold on, let me brush my teeth. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, and so, so she had to go through all of that on top of dealing with like me. So dude, I mean, she's a saint, you know what I mean? Um, and my biggest thing was, you know, I just recently wrote a blog post about, you know, resistance and is violence and adversity and trauma and sadness and anxiety are all these means of which lessons are brought to you. So when we have all these things of like, um, you know, I like to call them resistance, right? I mean, because I mean, pain can be some form of resistance, adversity is some form of resistance, um, violence, all these things are, are under the umbrella of my, in my opinion of resistance. And when you are experiencing these things, yes, you are doing all the work, but it's the people around you that you surround yourself, surround yourself with that are either going to make you stay in that vehicle of perpetual downward cycle are going to help you have the tools to park that fucking vehicle and get out. Mm. You know what I mean? And so, um, it was a Vietnam veteran. Um, it was peers who I was, who I were, who I was, um, rehabbing with, you know, bouncing ideas off each other, talking to each other about like real meaningful conversations. Um, and it was my wife and, it was couples counseling that I, that I really attribute all those coming together along with counseling. I mean, dude, I was in counseling dude, since I was a kid. So like uh, for anger management. So it's like, I knew that whole counseling game. And I think that all those things combined really helped me see the light, you know, and then, too, sure. yeah. and then too, you know, like one of the biggest questions I had was like, you know, what kind of father am I going to be? Can I even be a father missing half my body? You know, does it take a full, like, how could I teach him how to do anything with half my body? And it was just, you know, a lot of it was learning how to be an amputee, but it was also learning how to like own it and be like, this is forever, man. And that's yeah. okay. You know what I mean? So it was just a very, um, and I think to you, like asking myself those kind of questions, you know what I mean? Like, what am I doing here today? What kind of dad am I going to be? What kind of dad do I want to be? What kind of dad do I don't want to be? You know, what kind of husband, you know, all these things, dude, I was failing at because I just didn't have any direction to, to where I was. Like, I've never been an amputee before. I couldn't call of a relative and be like, how do you be an amputee? You know, I couldn't do any of that stuff. You know what I mean? So I really had to adopt um, a mindset of, um, you know, you are the champion of your, you know, of your fate. You know, you're the captain of your soul, man. You know, it, it, it's you. It comes down to you, man. You know, Ralph Waldo Emerson, I was reading a lot of his essays, um, who's an American philosopher, you know, um, mm -hmm. individualism. Um, you know, I was reading, or I was reading, so, and then I, like, just started switching gears, man, and I was, I learned that diet isn't just something that you eat, you know, it's something also what you listen to, and what you think, what you see, all those are diets as well, and so I just started choosing a healthier diet for, for my mind. I memorized poems, you know, um, so where if I was standing in line for a prescription, didn't have a book, didn't have, you know, a podcast to listen to, didn't have anything, you know, I was, I wouldn't let this, my mind, I wouldn't let it just rest. I would focus, I directly, because if I let it rest, it would go into the, into the depths of despair. And so I was like, memorize something fruitful, something productive, and just say it on repeat. And um, I got radical with it, man. You know what I mean? Uh, I changed my voicemail. You know, because I was like, well, if I only have a message to give to the world, my voicemails 
a platform I could use. <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, yeah, dude, I was just, I even made a sign and I put it on my front door <laughs> of my house. You know, I was just getting right. You know, I, I would, I would, I would do whatever it took to get me out of that funk because, you know, you got to realize before all this happened, I was the top of my game, man. I was the fastest I ever was. I was the meanest I ever was. I was the most knowledgeable I'd ever had been. And in a blink of an eye, dude, I was infant status. I needed help to remove myself from the toilet. I needed help putting myself on the toilet. I needed help bathing myself. And then, you know, I couldn't sit for long periods of time. I couldn't stand for long periods of time. You know, I was in, you know, level 10 pain, you know, and so all of this stuff I feel like is resistance was teaching me something, man. And I feel like um, I was so low, dude, that like the thing that I needed to learn was to be grateful, you know, to appreciate, you know. Yeah. I think I answered your question. I think so. And I think you answered it. Uh, really well, considering how loaded that question was. Um, uh, but, you know, I, a lot of that, a lot of what you're saying kind of really resonates with me too, because, uh, you know, so I, I was in Afghanistan, same time you were. Uh, right. My brother was killed uh, just a couple of days after your, your friend was killed. Um, and coming home, I, I wasn't the same person. You know, I, I, I had a lot of anger. I, I was uh, just, I, I just wasn't, I wasn't the same. And, and, you know, talking to my wife all these years later, uh, you know, she recognized I wasn't the same person. So she tried to, to help me out where, where she could and kind of lead me in the right direction. But there's only, only so much one, any one person could do. And, and, you know, as, as hard as she tried, you know, like you, you're saying about your wife, my wife was a saint about it. You know, she, um, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't holding a grudge against me because maybe I wasn't, helping out with the, the newborn baby uh, quite as much as I, I maybe should have, or as much as she would have liked me to, because she knew I, I was going through some stuff and I, it, and life was just hard at the time. And, and she needed to help me get through that uh, phase of life. And, um, you know, so we, we got through that, you know, counseling helped, um, you know, but ultimately what got me through it was kind of like what you said, you know, what kind of father do I want to be? What kind of husband do I want to be? What, what kind of person? do I want to be, uh, you know, and, and, you know, if I'm looking at myself kind of from a third party view, like a, you know, 30,000 foot view, looking at me and my life, um, if I'm, if I'm seeing this angry, frustrated, upset person, who's not happy with anything, like what kind of life is that, that I'm, I'm, I'm really living. Um, and so, you know, it had to be on me to to kind of change my own attitude, change how how I approach things, how I saw things, and that's not to say from time to time that certain things never pop back up. But overall, I, I moved myself in the right direction. You know, towards a happier life. Tried to um, tried to deal with the emotions in a healthy way, as opposed to let, letting those emotions get the better of me, and 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 then ultimately they would have they would have ended up getting the better of my entire life because they would have run into to my relationship with my wife and my kids and, and all this other stuff and, and all the other relationships that I had. So, you know, ultimately it, had I not taken control of that, um, you know, on my own, uh, th this life would have been a much different, uh, different life that we're, we're looking at here. I, I don't know that I'd be in the same position that I'm in right now. Um, if I hadn't, taking control of that on my own. So, so, you know, what you're, you're saying really does resonate with me and, and hopefully it does with, you know, a lot of other people who might be listening as well. But, um, but I, I definitely agree. It's, it's a choice. It's a choice that you have to make. Um, right. I think at the beginning, it's not, I think at the beginning, it's, you're unaware that you have a choice. Yeah. And, and then somewhere along the line, you say like, like, what is this? Like, look at yourself, man. You know, like, what are you doing? Yeah. And, you know what I mean? Like, you know, a lot of people will say, like, oh, talk to yourself nicely. You know, I think, you know, there's a time and place where you got to tell yourself, like, hey, man, the fuck are you doing? <laughs> I mean, and it's like, you know, because these people who, 
who get hurt, these people who go to war, man, these people who enlist into the military, like, you got to understand, like, something about you is you are a thoroughbred of an individual, so to speak. You know, you're, you are a busy individual. You are somebody who, you know, takes initiative and, you know, is a workhorse, man. And sometimes those thoroughbreds get put into the back pasture. And that's, I think, is where you can have the perpetual downward spiral and you get something where, um, you know, suicide, homelessness, um, mass shootings, you know, all these, you know, these things that veterans have done. Um, and it all comes down to like, you have to honor yourself. And part of doing what veterans do is, you know, is a community aspect. You know, you, you, right now, do you, I, got, I feel like you're my friend. You know what I mean? Cause, sure. Yeah. I mean, you like, I mean, you're, you're, you're a cool kid club membership has already been paid for. You know, <laughs> there's, there's nothing, there's nothing that you have to do to prove to me of your merit. You know, those, you know, those things are already done. And it's because of, you know, similar experiences, similar choices in life. And I think that like, um, veterans need to like reach out to other veterans you know uh vets help sure. them, you know what i mean um you know because if we don't take care of our of each other then how then how can we expect um the general public to take care of veterans to to fight for our veteran rights to mm-hmm. fight for you know our benefits to to make sure that congress remembers their veterans you know when they're signing bills and stuff like that if we if we're not on the forefront at the tip of that spear how can we expect anybody else to fight for us? Yeah, and, and that's exactly right. Um, you know, like people like you, people like me, uh, the veteran community as a whole, we understand whether or not we've been through the same experiences. You know, I never stepped on an IED. I never lost a, any limbs or anything like that. But we understand the, the, the risks that we all signed up for, you know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we – like I, I – I knew going over overseas to Afghanistan that there are people who want to kill me and there are people who want to blow me up and they want to shoot me and they want to send RPGs up my ass and everything else, you know, but I, I knew that that was a risk that I was taking. And I think we all knew that, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and if we didn't, we're kidding ourselves, you know, quite right, frankly, right. I, I think that's, that's just a ridiculous thing to say. If, if, if you're sitting there like, oh no, I, didn't, I never saw that coming. Like, well, either either that or your leadership failed you, um, if, you know, um, which I don't think is the case. I think they, I think leadership across the board has uh, probably done a pretty good job at, at making the threats well known, so that we could do our jobs and we can we can uh, fight against this type of stuff. Um, but but we all knew, and we all knew what, what was going to happen uh, potentially to to any one of us, and. And we still signed up and did it anyway. So we have a bit of a shared understanding of what goes into uh, this type of stuff. And so if, if we can't help each other, if I can't help you, you can't help me and, <clears throat> you know, any number of other, uh, you know, veterans with other issues, if we can't help each other, how are we going to expect some politician or some bureaucrat who has no clue, who's never volunteered to go to a war zone or to carry a rifle and, you know, go fight an enemy. How how are we going to expect them uh, to be able to help us out, you know? Right. Or to even know where to start. You know what I mean? Because they may even have things where it's like, oh, I want to help these individuals and maybe I'm going to give them this. And it's like, I appreciate the kind gesture, but I don't need that. Exactly need is you know um you know smaller waiting lines in the VA what I need is you know um uh you know xyz you know what I mean you know and so you know what I need is you know the judicial system to understand that you know I'm not saying to give a pass to you know PTSD vets what I'm saying is that based off of their circumstances they should be treated under a different scope, you know what I mean? We'll maybe get a veteran judge, maybe, you know, 
so where that they can understand where this individual is coming from. You know, just just accurate representation across the board. You know, instead of just being like, oh, he's a troublemaker, and shove him down into the you know the penal system where it's like, well, come on, man, do you blame yeah. him? He put his hands inside of his buddy's brains. You know what I mean? Just stop the bleeding, like exactly you want to be touched <laughs> yeah. you know that that person yeah you know, someone like that is probably not going to come out uh as the uh, model citizen uh you know who's gonna you know toe the line you know and, and follow all the rules the way the way everyone wants them to you know right may i just um say one more thing dude it's like i think the reason like for me like i had to if I have to be honest with myself and, and to your listeners, man, is the fact that we went over together and we experienced these things together, whether or not you were actually pulling triggers or throwing grenades or not, what the, the truth of the matter is, we all went over there knowing that at the end of the day, we could be on the front lines. And whatever those circumstances are and those risks are, um, that's we're, we're willing to and we're okay with taking those risks. And how can we experience that and come home and feel like we can d- figure out this, you know, suit of life by ourselves? No, because when we come back, you've said it already, man, like you're just different. Because yep. you've seen different things, you've done different things and the common um, individual, you know, and how we learn how to, you know, my good friend Jack Lyons says, you know, we cross that river of life in combat or in deployment. And then when we come back to society, we're still wet. So how do we dry off, man? We dry off with the same people that we went over there with and got wet with is, you know, our community you know, and I'm not trying to say like we need to alienate the civilians or the veterans, you know, no, we don't, we need to coincide and, and co-mingle with each other and learn from each other. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And, and to the point of, you know, how we, we come back and we're different and, and stuff. I, I think if you've experienced some sort of trauma or traumatic event or whatever you want to call it, and you don't come back different, that's a person I'd be, I'd be concerned about. You know, yeah. like that, that's, that to me is, is something that, uh, maybe is more of a red flag. Right. And that may, maybe there was something going on beforehand <clears throat> that, that just wasn't caught, caught on, but right. <clears throat> anyway, um, uh, Julian, man, it, it's been, gosh, it's been a pleasure, uh, speaking with you. Um, we haven't really touched much on your podcast. Uh, would you be able to give us a little rundown on, on your pod, podcast, what that's all about and uh, where people can go to find out more about it? 100%, man. Um, it's Coffee with Julian. Um, primarily focusing on um, bridging that gap between civilian and, and civilian air quotes and veteran air quotes. Um, and really just trying to bring a better um, dialogue, man, to help the veterans succeed. You know what I mean? It's unedited, unsanitized platform, hearing stories directly from veterans themselves, maybe veteran nonprofits, uh, Gold Star families, um, and just to kind of capture their life lessons and give them a, a platform on, on how to, on how they want to share their story, you know, and share their perspective. Um, you can find it anywhere you get podcasts at, man. You can find me on, um, um, you can find me on Instagram at coffee with Julian and, um, Twitter, same thing at coffee with Julian and, but it's W I T coffee with Julian. Um, but yeah, dude, you know, I'm, I'm going to have links to all of this in the show notes too. So, you know, you don't have to, as you're driving your car to, to work now, you don't have to go jot any of this stuff down and spill uh, your coffee, all of your, your, uh, your nice clean shirt as you're, you're heading into the office or whatever. Uh, yeah. don't, don't do that. I'll, I'll have it all in the show notes. You can, you can find all of it pretty easily, uh, but I would encourage everyone who's listening uh, to uh, take a minute after you're done after you're done listening to this episode, uh, hit stop, go over, search for Coffee with Julian, uh, the podcast, and and take a look for that. Hit subscribe, leave a rating, leave a review. Uh, that'll really help out Julian. 
uh, and get, get his podcast, uh, you know, out there. Um, you know, really want to, uh, encourage people to, to hear different voices, uh, you know, throughout the veteran community. And, and it sounds like that's, that's exactly what, what Julian's doing here with his podcast. So, um, you know, really, uh, you know, hats off to you for, for, for what you're doing and, uh, you know, keep it up, keep, keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, man. Uh, you as well, man. You know, I appreciate the, the opportunity coming out to you um, and sharing each other's story, man. You know, building a friendship. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, I, I, I do like what you're saying, man. Do the drive on, you know what I mean? Because it's important, man. You know what I mean? You got to keep moving forward. Exactly. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, for, thanks for joining us. All right, man. You take good care, dude. I'll see you around. All right. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Drive On Podcast. If you want to check out more episodes or learn more about the show, you can visit our website, driveonpodcast.com, or on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Drive On Podcast.